All right, so here we are with a look at Immortal Unchained, which uh, caught my attention just because of the sort of uh, fairly unique combination of, well, what it really is, and uh, I was able to actually get access to it. So here we go. After about 14 hours, I think I have a fairly good, I suppose, interpretation of what I think of it, and I'm um, definitely probably going to keep playing it myself, but uh, here we go. So Immortal Unchained is at its heart a Souls-like, technically. One of the various games uh, after Dark Souls has sort of, uh, you know, ended that have tried to take up the mantle and uh, do something with it. Uh, either something entirely different or aping it very closely or, you know, what have you. And in the case of Immortal Unchained, I was kind of intrigued because, as you can probably see in the background, it's really a third-person shooter. Uh, when you think Souls-like, generally speaking, you think melee combat and a very heavy focus on quite challenging and quite complex melee combat. However, what we have here is not that at all, but it still uses a lot of mechanics that are in that sort of mechanical set known as the Souls-like. Now, things like, uh, you know, you have a replacement for souls bits that you will gather from killing enemies and lose when you die and you have to get back to where you die in order to get them back. You have a quite large level up menu with lots of things to make your build off of and lots of weapons and things to uh, alter that build to where it's probably not going to be the same between multiple playthroughs and multiple people because they're all going to play it quite a bit differently and uh, so on and so forth. The comparisons will continue throughout the video because it's that's what it is. It's even in the description of the game that it's sort of the a very hardcore RPG in that vein. So here you have actually just put a little bit of boss footage in to show you the bosses. And uh, I suppose we'll start there. What are the boss fights like? Because when you think Souls-like, you think good bosses. Well, in this game, in my opinion at least, the bosses are kind of hit and miss. Uh, I think that some of the bosses that I've fought so far have been pretty enjoyable, uh, kind of neat mechanics, and just generally fun and hectic to fight, but in a way that made sense. A couple of them, though, have been really odd. Uh, the one you just saw there, I would actually put in the good boss category because it, it had clearly set up mechanics as to how the fight was supposed to work. And it delivered on that quite well throughout the entire thing, and it didn't last too long. Or have any sort of, like, unnecessary BS mechanics. And uh, the first couple of bosses are similar, but there are some here and there that definitely stretch things a little bit. Do things like uh, have a few too many instant hit attacks, a little bit too much health for... Uh, where in the game you're meant to encounter them to where you're either going to have to just deal with it or do some grinding to actually do enough damage to them and a couple of other things like that there's in fact a uh, in the second area of the game Viridian which is a forest area uh, there's a swampy bit to it and this place is very annoying because it has a ton of these uh, sort of suicide bomber type of enemies that will run up and explode and leave a big poison gas field all over the place which are obnoxious. It's not so much that they exist, is that there are dozens and dozens of them throughout the area that pop up out of the ground and try and go after you. But in that area, there is an optional boss that you can fight called the Amber Monarch. And for the time in which you actually are meant to be going through this area, the sort of vague level of power that you will have at this point, that boss is massively overtuned. Uh, it suffers from a couple of problems that you'll find with some enemies in this game, but not most of them. And it suffers from things like uh, melee attacks that have almost no wind-up whatsoever and actually kill you instantly. Uh, that boss will one-hit kill you pretty much no matter what but at the point you encounter him, which is not great. It would be okay if it was a large, heavy upward swing or something that you could see coming, and uh, it would make sense that it would punish you very badly for not dodging it, like maybe even kill you. But pretty much every one of his melee attacks, even the ones that are extremely quick, like backhand with his mace kind of attacks will also just one-shot you immediately. He also is fought in water, which isn't the worst thing ever, but there are some places in the water that you cannot go. And there are a couple of other problems with the fight, such as about 15 or 20 of those uh, bomb enemies that show up during the fight. And he's also got a shoulder-mounted mortar, a frost mortar, which is a cool thing and makes sense for the boss fight, but it is also uh, one of the other problems of this game in that um, some of the animations, I think, are a little bit too long. Uh, there are moments where you are without the ability to actually input anything to your character, and those moments last for too long, in my opinion. 
Uh, things like getting staggered or getting knocked down uh, after you use a healing syringe, which is the Estus Flask of the game. As you can see right there, I was actually unable to dodge for several times because of the stagger effects. I think some of these windows of opportunity for the enemies last a little bit too long, and uh, they're quite easy to fall into. Uh, and I think that comes with the fact that this game doesn't cue your inputs, like a game like Dark Souls does, where if you say you hit dodge and then hit heal while you're still dodging, as soon as your character gets done with the dodge animation, they'll drink. That's how it works. Uh, this game doesn't have input queuing like that, so it results in a lot of dropped inputs when you're frantically pressing things and trying to get the earliest possible frame to do something, like dodge out of the way or reload or something like that. And uh, it's kind of unfortunate because otherwise the game controls just fine. It actually controls very well. But, uh, like, you know, the dodging makes sense. You go between a rolling dodge and a sort of Bloodborne style dashing dodge, depending on if you're aiming with your weapon or not, and things like that. The, the, all that control scheme uh, feels very good for a game of this sort, except for the fact that it doesn't cue your inputs, which means you'll sort of press buttons fairly often that don't do anything. The game itself is uh, quite difficult, but mostly fair up to this point, I would say. Uh, the difficulty mostly comes from in what you would expect from a Souls-like, you know, learning the levels, learning the enemy patterns, uh, learning how they attack and how they actually spawn, because in this game, something that may not enthuse some people, the enemies aren't always walking around in the world. Uh, sometimes they spawn, they're sort of teleported in. That doesn't happen for every single enemy, and it also doesn't happen in the middle of a fight. They don't just teleport more in infinitely. But uh, there are certain areas where enemies will sort of phase into existence with this uh, green digi digitized effect to show that they're spawning. So unlike a game like Dark Souls, not every enemy in the world is actually spawned, and you can see patrolling and things like that. So it does make it a little bit harder to go into some areas fully prepared occasionally, but to the game's credit, so far it has not used that in an unfair way to just spring an unavoidable trap the first time so you have to know what's coming or something like that. That hasn't happened yet, so and I really don't think that it will because I think that the game is designed better than that. Now, as I mentioned, it is very much a third-person shooter, and uh, it carries that DNA with it throughout its entirety. It's definitely got a lot of Souls-like elements, but its combat, as you can very clearly tell, is based mostly on ranged weapons, firearms specifically. And uh, you do have a melee weapon, but uh, the melee weapons are more of an aside and not the main focus of the combat. They are very useful, especially to do things like this, where you can finish off enemies and uh, over otherwise sort of disable them and hit them quite hard in order to save ammo, because ammo is a very limited resource in this game. You do not get your ammo back unless you use a consumable item that there aren't a whole lot of, so you gotta save those for important pieces like maybe a boss fight where you're about to win or you go back to an obelisk or die, and the obelisks are the bonfires of the game. These will be your checkpoints as you make it through the various areas and eventually find them in order to, uh, you know, have a place to level up your character, upgrade your equipment, and just rest and chill for a minute, and the last one you have activated is the one that you'll spawn at every time you die. So they are exactly like bonfires in that aspect. And, uh... I will say one of my favorite parts of the game, actually, I've you know said a couple of negative things, so a couple of positive things. The weapons are really fun. They uh, have a very large variety of firearms and melee weapons to actually use, and they're pretty cool and they're very satisfying. You can find all sorts of weird combinations, like uh, this shotgun right here is an auto shotgun that actually has an acid thrower underneath it, so it's... Uh, Every range weapon has a power attack, which is basically an alt fire that uses that blue energy meter instead of ammo. Sometimes both. And uh, it actually just sprays out a cloud of dissolving acid in front of me, so that makes sense for a shotgun, because you tend to be quite close to things to use it. I've also seen a uh, sort of bullpup assault rifle with a flamethrower underneath it. Uh, even things like energy sniper rifles with grenade launchers attached to them. Uh, there's a lot of variety in what you can actually use and build yourself around. And these are not randomly generated, I should point out. This isn't like Borderlands or anything like that, which I think in a game like this wouldn't necessarily serve it very well. I think it's good the way that they've done it. A weapon is just that weapon. If you It has a name and a drop and things like that. And if you get another drop from the same enemy of that weapon with the same name, it will be the same. They are not randomly generated and pieced together. They are set weapons. And, uh... That means you can do the, you know, classic RPG thing of different weapons having different uh, requirements to actually make uh, use of for your character. So you know, there are some things that you simply won't be able to do, depending on what build you're going for. 
Although this game does that a bit differently as well. Uh, something I should probably note, in a game like Dark Souls and many other games that have tried to do things in that vein, whenever you level up your character, you're presented with a lot of various stats to actually make use of. Also, don't kill yourself with a grenade. And these stats have very clearly uh, shown impacts on your character, whatever they'll actually do. And in this game, that works exactly the same way. You acquire those bits in order to level yourself up and do a couple of other things. They are very much the currency of the game, just like souls. And this uh, will allow you to increase your stats and do various things. However, in a game like Dark Souls, the weapon requirement stats and the weapon damage scaling stats are the same. So strength and dexterity, for instance. If you want a more powerful strength weapon, then you'll level strength, which will upgrade the scaling that it uses and make it stronger. If you want to use a very heavy weapon, you'll probably need a lot of strength to do it. So they're both the same uh, idea. This game actually does it in a very different way, whereas you have two stats that alter the scaling of weapons, whether they are physical or um, energy-based weapons, the two different stats that actually are relevant to that and how their damage will scale up as you level that stat up. However, the actual requirement stats that allow you to use certain weapons and you need a certain threshold of to be able to equip different things are not those. They are a different stat entirely that affects something else. Uh, finesse, for instance, is a stat that you need to uh, do quicker reloads and uh, it also affects a lot of long-range weapon requirements. So you'll probably have to have a lot of finesse to actually equip a sniper rifle, for instance. But... Uh, the finesse stat doesn't make sniper rifles stronger, or any finesse weapons stronger. Uh, that's just for requirements. So that is a bit of a different way to do things. Generally speaking, you have the the two things, the requirement and the scaling, actually governed by the same things. But in this case, uh, they decided to do it differently. And I think it works in this case, because we're talking about firearms. And the uh, <clears throat> they tend to stay good for quite a while. Um, Pretty much all of them so far I've found have been uh, pretty usable. There's some that I haven't liked so much because of maybe just uh, a very long reload time mixed with a very low damage compared to what else I have, but that's probably because I just wasn't specced to actually use that particular type of weapon very well, like an SMG for instance. But uh, I think, yeah, this multiple tiered kind of requirement system works when we're talking about guns because of the way that the stats and damages are actually doled out on them. And you'll see there another kind of unique thing that this game actually does. That was an armor shrine. And uh, you may have noticed a little piece of armor sort of digitizing itself onto my character. Uh, you don't actually equip armor in this game. You do not find or equip or drop or anything pieces of armor that you then use. Uh, you actually instead find those armor shrines. And every time you find one, uh, a specific one gives you a specific upgrade. Anything from uh, more healing syringes you can carry, to more grenades you can carry, to better healing syringe efficiency, to um, just a reduction of all damage or a specific uh, resistance to a certain type of elemental damage, all sorts of stuff like that, these shrines can upgrade you with, depending on which ones you find. And every time you actually use a shrine, pieces of armor actually sort of manifest themselves on your character. So that means that you don't actually equip what you're seeing my character wearing that's all actually your character starts almost naked because they're a prisoner they just have like little manacles and uh, chains on their wrists a sort of tattered bit of bandage around them nothing on the torso at all they're just shirtless and uh, unless you're a female character of course and then just like gross torn bandages for footwear and uh instead of equipping new things you just find these shrines and it um sort of morphs your armor to a better and better appearance as you find them, which is a neat way to do it because it adds a sort of collectible uh, reward for exploration, and exploration in games like this is always very important, so having a method like that to actually reward the characters for doing it, just making them permanently better by enhancing their armor, is a very good incentive to explore around because you will need that. And uh, that's not to say there isn't any sort of appearance customization though. Uh, you do find various types of armor aesthetic differences that you can equip as items. So things like armor dyes and uh, armor styles and armor patterns, you can all you can get things like that to actually alter the look of what you have rather than equipping new things. So 
overall, so far, it's been mixed, but mostly positive. I would say that's kind of my in interpretation of the whole game. So far, it's mixed, but mostly positive. There have been a couple of things here and there that I've wondered what the design decision was to actually make it that way. Why is it like that? And most of the things so far have been genuinely enjoyable and a very good time. Uh, to the game's credit, one of the most difficult aspects of the Souls-like moniker is its level design. Uh, because the games like that require a very specific type of level design that is often quite maze-like. Uh, it has a lot of shortcuts back to previous areas that actually make sense and, like, geologically makes sense. It actually works within the level so you know where you're going because there's no map and you're not supposed to need one. You're just supposed to explore and find your way with your eyes. And, uh, to this game's credit, it does do that well. And that's actually kind of a rarity in this genre, this subgenre, mechanical set, whatever you want to call it that uh, other people have tried and not have done so well at all the time. Like, you know, games like Lords of the Fallen come to uh, mind for that. It was very pretty, but uh, it had a lot of problems with its level design. This game's level design is very satisfying to explore. There are rewards everywhere to incentivize your exploration. And uh, that brings me on to the key system, which is a bit weird because it's linked into the exploration aspect. Unlike in a normal game where you find a key and it goes to a door, and in this case you have these sort of key items that you will gather and uh, different containers like chests that you'll find around the place in hard to reach areas or even doors and bridge uh, mechanisms and things like that will actually require you to have these on you but they're not consumed. Uh, the Cerium Decree is the main one though there are a bunch of other types and uh, you actually need a specific number of those to open certain chests and it doesn't get rid of them once you use them it just means you have to have at least that many in your inventory and as you explore harder to reach areas you'll find these decrees in other chests and things like that to make sure you can open up pathways later on open up better and better chests filled with loot and things like that which is again linked into the exploration and level design being worthwhile and interesting you've also got uh, one of the other most important aspects of games like this which is the enemy placement and i think this is where this particular game falters a little bit sometimes uh, you know, enemy placement in a game like Dark Souls is supposed to be a game of chess, effectively. And uh, you're supposed to go into an area knowing what's there, and how your particular character build can actually deal with it most effectively without getting smashed into the ground. This game goes for, as I mentioned earlier, a slightly different approach, where only some of the enemies are actually spawned in at all times and patrolling around paths so that you can, you know, see where they are. Whereas other enemies will sort of manifest themselves into the world when you're quite close to them. They don't just spawn on top of you, and like I said, there's nothing cheap that I've found so far that's been done in the game to uh, make it like one of those traps that will kill you every time. The first time you see it, you have to know that it's there, otherwise I haven't found anything like that. But this does mean that the enemy placement is a bit weird. Uh, sometimes I feel that some areas have just too many enemies. And uh, kind of like the Dark Souls 2 problem, where there were situations where you could just sort of get ganged up on by a bunch of enemies very, very easily, that you don't necessarily have the, uh, the foresight to actually know that this is going to happen when you walk in here. And uh, that's a bit unfortunate. I think that the, there's a bit of a disparity between the difficulty of enemies sometimes and how much of a reward they give. Usually in other games of this nature, when you kill a very difficult, very large enemy that takes a while, you'll be rewarded for your time, but in this case they tend to not drop that many more bits per kill, so you really just need to sort of deal with it and try and get through as best you can. Now, there aren't too many enemies like that, but when they appear, they are kind of obnoxious, uh, because generally speaking, uh, a very uh, cleverly created combination of enemies around an area that would happen in a game like Dark Souls, can get totally screwed up in a game like this where you just have a large smattering of enemies all spawning in that you didn't see before and just coming together into one giant battle that you didn't necessarily want to happen. Now there's a bit more of leeway for this kind of spawning behavior because you're using ranged weapons, not melee weapons, so you're like not as f close to the action. There's room in what's basically a range for things like this to occur, more so than there would be if everyone was wielding melee weapons exclusively all the time. But uh, it does mean that occasionally the enemy placement feels not necessarily cheap, but a bit overindulgent. Like, you could have a level with this same exact number of enemies if you just space them out a little bit better, and you wouldn't have long corridors with nothing, but you also wouldn't have one corridor just jam-packed with everything. And that can occasionally happen, I've noticed, in the uh, level design of this game. Although not so often as to put me off of playing it, just here and there. I think that... 
probably uh, its best aspects are what are often at least considered by me to be the best aspects of Souls-like games in general. The, the idea of player choice, how many things you can do with your character, and how different multiple playthroughs will probably be because of all the very large variety in equipment and things like that that uh, is both fun to use and meaningful to obtain. And uh, that generally means that the game is a joy to play, for the most part, with elements of frustration. It's basically how I would have described Dark Souls 2 back in the day, the first time I played it. I actually am a, a vehement defender of that game. I will not back down on that one, but it is true that that game had a lot of problems. And I found that playing it the first time through was sort of a mixed bag of, this is really cool, and oh my god, why is this here? And this game kind of feels like that sometimes. It's uh, about 80% enjoyment, with 20% just trying to bash your way through an area with frustration until it finally works, because it just doesn't feel as uh, well designed as the other areas that you've just come from. And uh, so far, I will also say that there is uh, quite a significant variety in actual arenas, which is nice. You're not just going in sort of one location in the whole game. There are several planets that you go across, and each one even has different segments to it that alter its appearance entirely. That uh, fiery forest area that you saw earlier was actually part of a very verdant very green forested area before, and it even had a very swampy, very foggy and murky area in it as well, just overgrown with vines and tangled things on the ground that could uh, trip you up and stuff like that. So there are definitely a lot of areas to traverse and a good number of places in terms of the tile sets and things like that, so it's not something that you'll get tired of too quickly in terms of uh, where you're actually headed, because I know that's a problem with some games. They kind of lack on the environmental content when they've put it into so many other areas. This definitely feels like a full package of people that have done things before and are actually quite competent and they definitely know what they were trying to go for and I think it's pretty neat that they actually tried to go for this because I've never seen this and I always want to be able to say that when I'm when I've played something through that I've never really seen that before and it's something a bit new and you don't always get to do that so I appreciate what they've done with this game even if a couple of the uh, bits of it have most definitely fallen a little short and have become more of a frustration than an, a, uh, a joy to actually play through, that's still just small portions of an overall pretty cool experience. I would say that if you are a fan of third-person shooters, this is one to look at because it does capture that plodding, uh, somewhat slow-paced, very chess-like combat of the Souls-like, but very successfully, but puts it into a third-person shooter rapper, which, like I said, I've never really seen done before. And I think also that uh, the overall variety in places to go, enemies to fight, and equipment, most importantly, equipment to equip yourself with, is a very, very positive thing. And helps to increase the replay value and the overall display time of the game in a way that is actually, you know, makes sense. If you are curious about the game, you can take a look at it on its Steam page, which I have linked below. In the description, the game is 50 bucks, and uh, if you find that to be a fair price for a pretty unique third-person shooter with a lot of very enjoyable elements and some flaws, then uh, definitely check it out. Because so far, I have enjoyed my time with it most of the way through, and uh, those areas that I thought were very frustrating generally gave way to new interest and new enjoyment as I went farther into the game and found more new stuff. So I'd say that's pretty good design for the most part. And uh, also, one final thing to mention, there is no multiplayer. Uh, no sort of co-op or invasion or anything like that, because I know a lot of Souls-likes do like to also emulate that aspect of the Souls games to varying degrees of success, but this game has decided to keep it a completely single-player experience, so if that will inform your purchase decision at all, then there it is. It is single-player only. I think that works fine, uh, personally. But uh, there we go. Thank you guys very, very much for watching. And uh, I'll see you next time.